Life on Earth is ruled by the forces of nature. Fire and ice, wind and water. Elemental forces that bring death as well as life. They can wreak destruction on an epic scale. These are the forces of nature's rage. Fertile plains of the American Midwest. Beautiful, tranquil. This is the heartland of a continent. But every spring and summer, this tranquility is destroyed. With no warning, the skies darken and boil, spawning fierce thunderstorms and unleashing the most powerful winds on Earth. Tornadoes can touch down anywhere in dozens of countries all around the world. But here in the American Midwest, they strike with frightening regularity. That's why this region is known as Tornado Alley. Most people flee tornadoes, but there are some who actually stalk them. In Norman, Oklahoma, at the U.S. National Severe Storms Laboratory, the scientists of Project Vortex are investigating the mysterious alchemy that triggers tornadoes. Now, teams, do you have an escape off of that in case the storm moves off to the east? They're deploying portable Doppler radar to track the complex winds that spawn twisters. It's a powerful tool in the fight to save lives. The struggle to predict when and where tornadoes will strike. It's amazing how little is known fundamentally about how tornadoes form. And so what we're trying to do is to uh, advance the warning time, and cut back on the false alarm rate. We feel that if we can give people 20 minutes to 30 minutes lead time, then people can take the proper precautions. The Vortex team must take precautions themselves. Their equipment is sophisticated, but it's delicate. Some fairly heavy precipitation back there. There may be some hail. If there is hail, we don't know how large it is, and we don't want the uh, we don't want large hail to hit the antenna. With a severe thunderstorm approaching and hail on the horizon, the situation could get very bad very fast. We have to go. We have to go right now. Follow us. The time has come to find a safer vantage point. A tornado may be on its way. Hail provides an early warning and it's already beginning to fall. When ordinary raindrops are lifted high by strong updrafts, they can freeze into balls of ice the size of a grapefruit before plunging to earth in a deafening barrage. For some, it's just a novelty, a bizarre snowstorm in midsummer. But with each projectile weighing up to a pound and falling at a speed of 90 miles an hour, a hailstorm can be a disaster. By itself, hail would be destructive enough but it can also be a sign that a tornado is on its way. That's a familiar fact of life here in Tornado Alley. And when a twister approaches, there's only one means of defense. Get out of its way. At Wakita Elementary School in Oklahoma, 
the normal routine is broken by a tornado drill. When the siren sounds, men, women and children head underground. There's no predicting a twister's path. A storm cellar is the safest escape. Since tornadoes rarely last more than a few minutes, a shelter doesn't need much in the way of equipment or supplies. But as the Crockett family of McLean, Texas discovered, a storm cellar can be the key to survival. We blew away right on this location. This is what's left of it. We watched it coming. See those trees way over yonder about. We heard glass breaking and extreme winds. We were just praying. You couldn't breathe and it just the pressure. It was like your drums are gonna blow up. I didn't think we were gonna make it. The Crockett's escaped with their lives, but not much else. It's not so much the house, but the little keepsakes that you've had for years, you know, family heirlooms and things that are gone. It, it, it's, it's hard. Well, I haven't thought of moving. I want to be able to ride back here. This is home. We've been here all our life, and this is where our children were raised. Tornadoes can strike any time, but late spring and early summer are high season. That's when North America's Tornado Alley becomes the ideal breeding ground for severe weather. It's spawned by the collision of opposites. Dry, cool air blowing in from the west meets warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. The warm air is lifted to form a giant thunderstorm called a supercell. In the lower part of the storm, fast winds meet slower winds, creating a spinning tube of air that'll give the twister its twist. If the tube is lifted by an updraft, the funnel goes vertical and a tornado is born. These days, tornadoes are often spotted as soon as they form, but in the past, they struck with no warning at all. The giant cyclone that swept through downtown Waco, Texas in 1953 killed 114 people. The great Dallas tornado of 1957. This was the first one to be extensively filmed. As often as these killers have struck, few people have ever had a really close look at one and survived. Incredibly, one man found himself inside a tornado funnel and lived to tell about it. He was Roy Hall. His widow vividly recalls that day in May 1948. It was a windy, windy day all day long. It kept getting darker and darker. My husband said, there has to be a tornado. He stayed out on the lawn with his camera and suddenly big hail the size of grapefruit started falling. He came on through the house. He was going to the back room where we were and it knocked him down. He was lying on his back. Suddenly, the house was gone, and he looked up right into the eye of the tornado. Paul's vision comes alive in his own words. Something had billowed down from above. It was the lower end of the funnel. I was looking at its inside. The funnel extended upward for over a thousand feet, swaying and bending. It seemed to be partly filled with a bright cloud, which shimmered like a fluorescent light. Roy Hall's family counted themselves lucky to survive an encounter they never sought. But all across Tornado Alley, there are many who'd love the chance to see what Roy Hall saw. Storm chasers like Tim Marshall are after more than thrills. They bring back hundreds of hours of video, crucial clues to understanding killer cyclones. Tim and his partner will continue this pursuit well into the night.
At the edge of a small Kansas town, the men hear a chilling sound. It's the familiar wail of a tornado siren. Their quarry may have found them. The storm chasers escaped that night, but many others were not so lucky. A direct hit from a twister can make buildings literally explode. With debris hurling through the air at 200 miles an hour, a cyclone becomes a death wind. While no lives were lost to the whirlwinds in Kansas that night, the little town of Jarrell, Texas, would not get off so easily. Viewed from outer space, the storm that spawned the killer was a monster. From a snaking funnel, it grew into a giant. Tornadoes are classified by wind speed and destructive power. The one that hit Jarrell was near the top of the scale, an F5, with winds over 260 miles an hour. In some parts of town, devastation was total. Many residents had a few minutes advance warning, but nowhere to go. Their houses were built on concrete slabs with no storm cellars. The wind simply wiped their homes off the face of the earth. Those who survived the fury of the storm will never forget it. It sounded like the freight train, just like they said. I always saw was a big black cloud twirling, and there was a lot of debris, but it was, uh, it was like we were on the outskirts of it. Definitely very lucky to be alive. When we were in the closet, I got scared. But when I really was scared is when I went down and saw the devastation it left behind. Just, I've never seen anything so devastating in my life. The Red Cross rushed to provide food and comfort for the homeless. For many, the shelter's most important feature was this bulletin board. Often the only way to find out if loved ones were still alive. Some survivors would have to wait days before their questions were answered, as rescue workers sorted through the wreckage. The final death toll at Jarrell was 27. It was America's most lethal tornado of the year. To compound the tragedy, this was the second time in less than a decade that Jarrell was flattened by a twister. And it's certain that more are on the way. It's just part of life in Tornado Alley. Tornadoes are terrifying. But there's another hazard that can descend from a thunderstorm. And everyone is vulnerable to its deadly strike. Lightning. It frightens and fascinates us. One of nature's most spectacular phenomena, and one of its least understood. But one thing we do know, when lightning strikes, the results can be catastrophic. It felt like I stuck my hand in a wall socket and just kept it there instead of pulling it back. Yeah, I looked around and I seen my friend. He was laying about 15 feet from where we started. I could tell he was dead. All I remember was like a flow, a funnel of water, bright, light water being funneled into my body with such force. Most of us try desperately to avoid lightning, but there are a few who actually seek it out. Warren Fadley is a photographer based in Tucson, Arizona, who specializes in shooting severe weather. One of his favorite subjects is lightning. The most commonly asked question is, why do I do this? It encompasses so many of the things I enjoy. It's adventurous, it's a challenge photographically, there's some element of danger. It's you against the storm to get the right picture at the right time. It's just it's something that's irresistible.
Sometimes, even Warren needs a little extra help in locating his quarry. Luckily, his home base, Tucson, is also the home of the U.S. National Lightning Detection Network. When lightning strikes, sensors across the country flash the news to computers here within seconds. The resulting display is like a CAT scan of America's thunderstorms. Tracking lightning as it strikes is helping researchers unravel the mysteries behind this spectacular phenomenon. But there's much more to lightning than meets the eye. During a thunderstorm, opposite electrical charges build up in a cloud and on the ground below. To release the cloud's negative charge, an electrical surge cuts a channel through the air. Near the ground, it draws positive charges from the tallest objects. When the circuit is complete, a bright bolt leaps upward. More strokes move up and down the same path, but it happens so fast, our eyes see only a single bright flash. That flash can be 10 miles long and cook the air along its narrow channel to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Around the world, lightning splits the skies 100 times every second. And each year, thousands of people are struck down by a lightning strike. Some prime candidates walk around in wide open spaces, wear spikes on their shoes, and swing metal sticks through the air. Golfers provide the perfect path for a lightning bolt's journey from cloud to ground. One victim is Gary Shaw. We teed off on the first hole and away we went and it was nice. By the second and third holes it started to sprinkle a little bit and then started to get nice again so we just kept on going. By the time we got to the fifth hole it just poured so we just ran so we ran to the tree my buddy said you know this is not the best place to be standing we shouldn't be standing here and that was the last thing I remember the lightning hit the tree and the splash effect from the tree to us and in my head the top of my head and went through my body and exited through my golf spikes my friend just by looking at him I could tell he was dead in the United States alone, lightning kills about a hundred people every year. But twice that number are struck and survive. Lightning can even hit people who think they're safe indoors. When I hear a thunderstorm now, I'm very apprehensive. I close the doors of the house and pull the blinds and I feel safer, but not safe. Steve Marshburn Sr. was working inside a bank, but walls and windows couldn't stop the bolt. It was a sunny day, beautiful day, and I was at work. I was standing at the drive-up window. A bolt of lightning struck the window, came in the speaker, hit me in the spine. Immediately, I began having severe headaches, um, memory problems, and this went on for 15 years in my case. Lightning survivors carry a record of the trauma within their bodies for the rest of their lives. But there are people who actually try to summon lightning from the sky. We are armed, we are ready. On my mark, we will fire. Negative seven, negative 7.5. Three, two, one, and fire. We got it, all right, good shot. At a National Guard base near Gainesville, Florida, a test facility is designed to trigger artificial lightning strikes. Instead of waiting for a natural lightning bolt to strike, the engineers here lure a bolt down from a thunderstorm, measuring its force and studying the results. Their technique, a modern version of Ben Franklin's kite. A rocket trailing a wire is fired at a thundercloud. Close to the cloud, it can jumpstart a bolt, a multi-million watt circuit between earth and sky. Negative six and I'm armed. Video is armed on. Put the fire and on my mark. Three, two, 
Sometimes lightning can leave a calling card. If it strikes on sandy soil, a lightning bolt can fuse grains of silicon into a strange sheath of glass called a fulgurite. It's like frozen lightning, preserving the zigzag pattern of a bolt as it makes its way from sky to ground. Another incredible manifestation happens far above the earth and lasts for a mere instant. Scientists only recently confirmed the existence of exotic varieties of lightning that flash upward from thunderstorms high in the atmosphere. As colorful as they are fleeting, they've been dubbed blue jets and red sprites. Most of us will never witness these exotic forms of lightning. But even the everyday variety can produce an awesome display. Photographer Warren Fabley has perfected the art of catching a bolt from the blue. What I'm able to do is to, to freeze that moment in time. capturing something that's that's so powerful and brilliant and elusive uh, and it's it's almost like hunting there the lightning bolts uh, on the film or the trophies but the greatest reward with shooting lightning is you've captured something that would have otherwise been lost forever A bolt of lightning, flashing randomly from the sky, has a subterranean counterpart, the sinkhole. A sudden collapse of the earth that can swallow streets and houses with no apparent rhyme or reason. Sinkholes are created by water. When heavy rain or underground streams percolate through layers of limestone, the bedrock can dissolve and the stage is set for a disaster. If the fragile crust breaks through, the results can resemble a bomb crater. From Japan to Ukraine to the United States, sinkholes can happen anywhere the ground is porous or water is on the move. They're just another reminder that our world is not as stable or as predictable as we'd like to think. But sinkholes pale in comparison to the most cataclysmic natural disasters of all. It looks like a normal day in Los Angeles, if any day can be called normal in this city of dreams. But today is different. The dream is about to become a nightmare. big one hasn't hit Los Angeles. Not yet. This was just an illusion. An amusement park ride. At Universal Studios in Hollywood, a major quake happens like clockwork a hundred times every day. But this is earthquake country. In fact, the building that houses the simulation is designed to withstand the real thing. 
and a real quake follows no schedule and strikes without warning. Throughout history, devastating earthquakes have come again and again, and their greatest fury has been felt in some of the world's greatest cities. In 1906, the boom town of San Francisco was leveled by a massive tremor. Much of what was left standing after the quake was consumed in the fires that followed. Seventeen years later, an even stronger shock flattened Tokyo. Once again, fires broke out in the ravaged city, and they were responsible for most of the 100,000 deaths. Anchorage, Alaska, Good Friday, 1964. The greatest tremor ever recorded in North America. It measured 8.4 on the Richter scale of earthquake intensity. Tangshen, China. In 1976, more than a quarter of a million were killed here in the deadliest quake in modern times. When the earth trembles, it leaves ruin and tragedy in its wake. Often the same places are struck again and again, as the people of San Francisco discovered in 1989. Causes are built into the structure of our planet. The Earth's crust is like a cracked eggshell, composed of nearly two dozen plates floating on top of a molten core. The plates continually grind against each other. Sometimes the edges snag, causing pressure to build up. When a snag gives way, it can release massive amounts of energy. This is an earthquake, and this is what it can do. In January 1994, California was rocked yet again. When the North Ridge quake struck Los Angeles, parts of the city were shattered in seconds. Lives were shattered too. Homes were destroyed. Loved ones missing or buried in the ruins. Fortunately, Los Angeles has prepared for the worst. An elite team sprang into action. A special unit of the LA County Fire Department called USAR, Urban Search and Rescue. Their mission is to locate and liberate trapped victims. Their secret weapon is training. USAR trainees hone their skills on an urban obstacle course, a simulation of the challenges left by a major earthquake. Give me five more times. Locating victims trapped under collapsed buildings requires special skills and high-tech tools like search cam. This tiny video camera can be snaked into a narrow crevice, allowing rescuers to size up the situation. I got a visual. Right now I got a female in her uh, late 20s in a uh, supine position. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, tap five times. One of the most effective tools in urban search and rescue has four legs and a tail. Dogs can cover large areas quickly, sniffing out victims faster than humans or machines. From Northridge to Mexico City to the Oklahoma City bombing, dogs help save lives in urban disasters. Hello? Are you okay? But for all the training, the true test of the USAR team comes when they face the real thing. When the Northridge quake hit Los Angeles in 1994, a man named Salvador Peña was trapped inside a collapsed parking garage for more than eight hours, while the USAR team struggled to free him. The thing that concerned me right away was the safety hazards, the overhead hazards, the pillars of concrete that were unsupported and uh, injured firefighters. We tried to fortify the area that we were working with to get in Salvador out. I was concerned whether or not we were going to be able to get out ourselves or if we were going to get trapped. We were directly underneath the same rumble pile that he was. 
we crossed your fingers and hoped that that would be enough uh, to, to outlast the aftershock. While the ground continued to rumble with aftershocks, the USAR team worked at the wreckage. The thing you're most concerned about in a small space when the aftershock hits is that small space still going to stay the same size. And, uh, you know, you, you're really quite concerned that uh, everything's going to tumble in around you. At last, Salvador Peña was free. To see him go to the hospital, still alive after all of that was, was tremendous because the probability of him surviving was very, very slim. Peña would recover from his injuries, but Yusar's work was far from over. Within the next hour, we transitioned to the Northridge Meadows Apartments, which were probably about a half a mile to a mile away. And the outcome was very much different. All of the people that were alive had been rescued before our arrival there, and we had the grim task of body recovery at that point. Even though we can't help that victim, we're helping the family and the survivors uh, to reach some kind of closure. 16 died in the Northridge Meadows apartments, the greatest single loss of life in the 94 quake. The death toll, like the earthquake itself, could have been a lot worse. Most experts agree that California is overdue for a massive earthquake. After all, the region is perched on top of a spider's web of fault lines, including the huge San Andreas Fault. If a major earthquake were to hit this city of 11 million, thousands of buildings could collapse, trapping many thousands of people. Emergency services would quickly be overwhelmed. That's what happened in Kobe, Japan, on January the 17th, 1995. A year to the day after Northridge, Kobe was rocked by a quake that hit 7.2 on the Richter scale. The shock lasted only 20 seconds, but it left this city of 1.5 million in chaos. Hardest hit were residential neighborhoods built without adequate reinforcement. Hundreds of people were buried in the rubble. The main elevated highway linking Kobe and Osaka was destroyed. Huge sections buckled. One bus driver found himself staring death in the face. Yoshio Fukumoto had driven the same route for years but that morning, his routine was shattered. I understood immediately that it was an earthquake. At first, the bus started shaking side to side. Then the road itself started waving. The only thing I could do was to keep pushing down the brake pedal. At the instant that the bus finally stopped, the road ahead of us went down. Fortunately, at that early hour, there were only three passengers on his bus. Had it been carrying more weight, it might not have stopped in time. It's a chilling reminder that in an earthquake, the distance between life and death is measured in inches. Elsewhere in the city, fires raged out of control. In the end, it would be one of the worst earthquakes ever to hit a modern city, and the most expensive natural disaster in history. Nearly 5,000 died in Kobe. 
250,000 buildings were destroyed or damaged. Just cleaning up the rubble would take years. The Japanese have invested heavily in the tools and technology of earthquake preparedness. But that didn't stop disaster from leveling Kobe. And while Japan and California are at least braced for the inevitable, most of the world's greatest cities remain totally unprepared, and many are at risk. Few realize that New York sits on top of not one, but several fault lines. With its densely packed towers of steel and glass, and its aging infrastructure, even a moderate quake here could produce a disaster of unprecedented proportions. We can only speculate on what might happen. Transportation, communications and emergency services all would grind to a halt. Casualties would mount as the city's ability to care for them vanished. As bridges, tunnels and highways collapse, Manhattan Island would be cut off, become isolated with emergency services unable to reach it. The World Trade Center towers and much of the downtown financial district would collapse and burn as porous landfill turned to quicksand. The death toll would be staggering, the cost incalculable. New York City as a financial, cultural and population center could cease to exist. There's smoke and fires everywhere. The city's devastated. There will be another great earthquake in Los Angeles, Tokyo, or somewhere else. No one can predict exactly when or where. And there will be no warning. Yet even for a disaster that can be predicted, the trick is forecasting its path and its target. Case in point, holiday weekend, the Atlantic coastline of North America, and a howling tropical storm by the name of Fran. Pope Air Force Base outside Fayetteville, North Carolina. An elite strike team prepares to go to battle. We have to go through the corner to, uh, Their adversary? The, 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 the deadliest weather on earth. A hurricane. When, where and how hard will Fran strike? To answer those life or death questions, these men, the hurricane hunters, must fly straight into the eye of a giant. Their mission is as risky as they come. Plunge a 30-year-old warplane head-on into winds that can top 200 miles an hour to measure with scientific precision a full-scale Atlantic hurricane. September 1938, the eastern seaboard is lashed by a tropical hurricane. For two days, the coast from New Jersey to New England felt its full fury. They strike with terrifying frequency, but in a random pattern no man or machine can ever predict. Each storm has a brutal personality all its own. They're even given names, Hugo, Camille, Andrew, Fran. A billion people live in their path. In a hurricane belt that circles the globe from Asia to Africa to the Americas. The storms Westerners know as hurricanes go by other names elsewhere. The tempests of the Indian Ocean are called cyclones. Time and again they've ravaged India, Bangladesh and their neighbors. One such cyclone in 1970 left over 150,000 dead. In the Western Pacific, 
their typhoons. When Typhoon Angela bore down on the Philippines in 1995, over a million people abandoned their homes and fled for their lives. Cyclone, typhoon, or hurricane. By any name, tropical storms are natural-born killers, all spawned by the same unassuming conditions. An Atlantic hurricane begins as a tropical depression off the coast of Africa. As trade winds carry the infant storm west across the ocean, it's fueled by warm seas. By the end of the journey, it's swollen into a raging whirlwind, 300 miles across. Hurricanes are rated on a scale of one to five. Packing winds of over 150 miles an hour, a category four or five storm can hit land with the force of an atom bomb. Hurricane Andrew did just that. When it slammed into the Florida coast in August of 1992, Andrew exacted a terrible toll. In the end, the storm left behind 61 dead and some $30 billion in devastation. America's efforts to fight these monster storms begin here at their National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. Our aviation, no gap, so here I am. The job of the Hurricane Center is to peer into the future, to turn mountains of meteorological data into a life-saving weather forecast. 34 knots, 150, 120. It's a hair-trigger business. Make the call too soon, and a last-minute change in course could have disastrous consequences. Too late, and those in harm's way will have no time to escape. With Hurricane Fran bearing down on the coast, media pressure builds for the center to name the storm's target. Well, if it makes a direct hit, the damage could be substantial, but right But exactly where Fran will strike is impossible to predict until the team in the air have probed the eye of the storm. And winds are building now, about 95. 200 miles from land, the hunters close in on Fran. What the forecasters will view from far away, the hurricane hunters will confront eye to eye. It's like going up on the roller coaster on the big hill and you're getting ready to go down. The roller coaster goes very slowly and all of a sudden you know it's coming and uh, a lot of times the plane will drop sometimes as much as 2,000 feet and uh, you get quite a ride. The roughest quadrant usually. The ride only gets rougher. Fighting winds of over 100 miles an hour, the aging plane takes a beating. The hurricane hunter's goal looms just ahead, the very heart of the whirlwind. Now we're coming into an area that's kind of in between the rings of the storm. To forecast Fran's path, they must pinpoint the whirlwind's exact center. Satellites and radar can't make the call. Only on-the-spot readings will do. The ultimate weapon in this battle is called a dropwind sonde. By ejecting this instrument package into the eye, they can lock in on the location and conditions at the heart of the storm. Computerized images show what the camera can't, the plane plunging into the worst winds surrounding the eye of the hurricane. Just about to punch into the eye wall. The pressure drops, the winds subside. The hunters have penetrated the eye. We're definitely inside now. The calm air of the eye is ringed by banks of wind-driven clouds and rain, a spectacular vista known as the stadium effect. I'm going to go ahead and load up now. You ready, drop? Final weather come right at uh, 15. After four harrowing passes through the eye, the team has the data they need. At last, the forecasters back in Miami 
can pin down Fran's target. Ground Zero, Wilmington, North Carolina. For the second time in less than three months, this strip of the Atlantic coast prepares for the worst. At least they have experience on their side. Sometimes the monsters of the Atlantic choose more unexpected targets. In January 1990, a late season hurricane stormed into southern England. 110 mile an hour winds left 41 people dead. Only three years before, a hurricane took Britain by surprise and caused massive damage. Although in 1990 there was advance warning, the south coast was at the mercy of the gale. In the United States as well, all the warning in the world can't stop the havoc. Fran hit home, packing winds of nearly 120 miles an hour. didn't see what had really happened at all. Then the eye came over about 10.30 and we all walked out and saw everything. And that's when I, it was the first time I've ever been afraid of a storm like this. wind never stopped. I mean, it just, you could hear the leaves and the trees and you just prayed that, you know, you weren't going to be killed by a tree falling in your house. People's homes are just totally gone, destroyed. We could see the trees just, you know, going everywhere. And uh, it sounded like you could hear it. I mean, it was sounding like a freight train, just roaring, and it kept roaring and roaring and roaring. Causing $5 billion in damage, Fran was the third most costly hurricane in US history. Many scientists believe that global warming and long-term weather cycles mean that more storms of far greater force are on their way. But for all the havoc wreaked by tropical storms, at least these monsters give their victims hours of warning. Another killer from the seas strikes almost unannounced. It's a terrifying phenomenon that can race across hundreds of miles in just minutes. A mountain of water. Tsunami. On November the 29th, 1975, one such killer wave visited the island of Hawaii. Well, there was two earthquakes, and the first earthquake early that morning woke us up. 17-year-old Mike Stearns and his fellow Boy Scouts were camping near the beach of Halape. We'd just gotten back into our bedding and trying to get back to sleep when the real big earthquake came that created the tsunami. And it was a moonless night. And uh, so we were over there trying to untie our shoes that were tied up from the rafters. That's when somebody said, look, and because we were facing away from the ocean and we saw the water, white water just come right up, right up to the um, shelter. We didn't know no tsunami was coming. 
Within seconds, the ocean surged up 40 feet. Mike and his friends were swallowed by the wave. It just felt like a wall just hitting me. I must have became unconscious. The only thing going through my mind was, I want to die fast, I want to die fast. I thought this was it. Life or death was a question of fate. So I just started calling for my friends. I didn't know who survived. When the waters receded, two people were dead. One, a leader of Mike's scout troop. For survivors of the giant waves, the shore may never feel safe again. Dr. Walter Dudley of the University of Hawaii has made the study of ocean waters his life's work. These waves we see moving across the, the water here are waves that are generated by the wind, but they're really only on the surface. Tsunami waves are, are different than the waves that move across the surface that are created by the wind because they're caused by a, an impulse in the ocean. An underwater earthquake can move mountains of water in mere seconds. The convulsion sends shock waves surging across the ocean. As the impulses race towards land, the water is forced upwards by the rising sea floor. When it reaches the shore, the tsunami's waves can tower above buildings and trees. On April 1, 1946, people of the Hawaiian port of Hilo refused to believe they were in the path of just such a monster wave. In 1946, the people took it as an April Fool's joke. In those days, downtown Hilo was filled with businesses and homes that were right along the waterfront. And as the wave struck that area, they demolished the buildings, the homes, the businesses, and there was a tremendous loss of life. And as a result, a lack of warning, 159 people died in the Hawaiian Islands, 96 in Hilo alone. The terrible toll convinced survivors and the United States government of the need for a killer wave alarm system. Today, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center monitors the ocean around the clock. At the first sign of the upheaval that breeds the giant waves, the warning center issues an urgent alert. Tsunamis can hit almost any coastline, but the Pacific is their chief spawning ground. Sitting at the western edge of this danger zone, the islands of Japan are a prime target for both earthquakes and tsunamis. A small tremor on a night in 1896 seemed to be no cause for alarm. People on the Sanriku coast went back to bed with no idea of what was coming next. The Sanriku tsunami is remembered as one of the most lethal waves in history. Tens of thousands were swept to their death by the wall of water. In this century, tsunamis have pummeled the Japanese coasts time and time again. In response to the threat, Japan has built walls. Nearly 2,000 miles of concrete, stone and steel have turned some of the most vulnerable Japanese coastline into a fortress against the sea. But when the truly great waves come, there is no defense.
tsunamis can be created by uh, exploding volcanoes, underwater landslides, and earthquakes. But there's one very special way of creating a tsunami, and that is if an object from outer space, an asteroid or a large meteorite, crashes into the Earth. And chances are, of course, it'll crash into the ocean. And that would create an enormous tsunami. Space. What we think of as endless and empty is in fact a very crowded and dangerous place. There's no doubt our home, our planet, is a target. Asteroids and comets have bombarded Earth since the dawn of time. The evidence is impossible to overlook. This mile-wide crater in Arizona is the explosive scar left by a chunk of rock from outer space. Its impact, some 50,000 years ago, must have killed every trace of life for hundreds of miles. Small meteors graze our planet with alarming frequency. In 1992, this fireball streaked over New York and Pennsylvania. With concern over the threat rising, NASA has tracked every meteor hit over the last decade. There have been 250, one every two weeks. In 1993, astronomers discovered a string of comets on a crash course for Jupiter. Stargazers around the world watched transfixed as this astronomical freight train slammed into the giant planet at 140,000 miles an hour. The largest impact threw up a giant fireball and a black cloud bigger than the Earth. Had it hit the Earth, the explosion would have released more energy than every atomic bomb ever made. Thousands of large asteroids regularly fly straight through Earth's orbit. It's only a matter of time before one scores a direct hit. A giant asteroid strike would be the ultimate disaster. It would spawn tempests of fire and lightning, immeasurable tsunamis, endless earthquakes and eruptions. But with plenty of advance warning, humanity might find some means to divert or destroy a killer asteroid, or a way to survive the aftermath. After all, since the dawn of time, we've been honing our survival skills against the boundless fury of nature's rage. <laughs>